Um, I want to thank uh, the uh, panelists that are going to be speaking here. Uh, Chief Robert Handy, uh, Huntington Beach Police Department. Um, Kent, Kent Smurl, I want to make sure I get everybody's name and title correct, because sometimes the titles change. Kent Smurl with Department of Fish and Game, and Ryan Drayback, uh, Director of Animal, Orange County Animal Care. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. I very much appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, this, this issue has been going on for a while. I, of course, have heard about it from uh, constituents in you know, various cities that I rep represent, Costa Mesa and Huntington Beach and other cities. Seal Beach is having a, a concern with it right now as well. And so, um, but recently, uh, some residents from Huntington Landmark came to me uh, about their concerns, and I told them I would address the issue. And so um, then I heard about what happened in Seal Beach. And so I feel it's important to have a regional approach. And I know there's a lot of perspectives out there. Um, my goal for tonight is to not only find a solution for Huntington Landmark specifically, but also to try to approach this from a regional approach. I know different cities have tried different approaches uh, from education to trapping and anything in between, and a, a variety of success, and sometimes the success goes up and down. So I feel there, that we need a way to be accountable to you on a regular basis, come up with a plan that's more regional based, uh, and then make sure we update you on occasion. So. I know people have concerns about the coyotes and animals in general. My concern is for the safety of the people who live here in the community. It's our seniors, uh, people with small kids, the kids themselves, and obviously the pets. Um, prior, uh, you know, in my opinion, coyotes are an important part of our the habitat, the ecosystem, but they come after kids. They come after our pets. So I want to come up with a plan. Thank you. I want to com come up with a plan that's accountable to you. And so my door is always going to be open on this issue. I appreciate it and I'm going to let our panelists uh, take a shot at this and then we'll open up to question and answer and uh, maybe some closing comments. But I didn't have a particular order of anyone who wants to go first, but I'll ask uh, the panelists to give some background, maybe their opinions. I will ask everyone here, please be polite. Uh, ultimately, no matter what we do, um, it's up to the elected officials really to take action and to give direction. Uh, please don't beat up the panelists too much. They're going to have differing opinions, different suggestions, different approaches. Uh, so we're here to learn, but ultimately after this I want to go forward with some type of tangible plan where not, you not only feel safer, but you are safer. So unless we have someone who wants to go first, um, Happy to go in. The <laughs> but just to give some background, maybe some of your experience or where you think we're at or where you think we should go. And, um, you know, oh, oh, you, Kent, do you want to go first? I can. Oh. I was going to give it to the chief. Okay. I'm, I'm fine either way. I'll go first. I think I was volunteered. Um, good evening. My name is Rob Handy. I am your uh, police chief for the city of Huntington Beach. Thank you. As most of you probably know, I've been here just under a year, and I was not here when we had the, um, the public debates over the coyote issue a couple of years ago. Um, I have learned quite a bit about what the city went through since then. As the police chief, I'm also responsible for our contract with animal control, and also obviously public safety. So it's an issue that I've become familiar with over the last probably six or eight months. When Seal Beach started to experience some of their issues, I reached out to the Seal Beach police chief and had conversations with him. And I also sent staff to their first town hall meeting and one of their council meetings. And then we have staff that has participated in the committee meeting that just was last week. So we are reaching out to them to try to make sure that um, our efforts and their efforts are combined at times or where we can and at least sharing information. We have had... Um, the need to start tracking coyote related calls for several years now and I'll just give you a brief snapshot over the last three years the types of calls that we've gotten. In 2012 we had a, a approximately 356 coyote related calls or sightings. Some of those were also um, where a pet had been um, you know attacked by a coyote things like that. There was a handful of those in that 356. Last year in 2013 that number came down to about 230. 
So that number came down. That was right in the middle of when we were really starting our public education, putting together. We have a pamphlet that we give out. We have a video on our website. We have some other information. I brought some. I'm not sure if I have enough copies for everyone, but we brought some information. Information that we put out routinely um, in a prevention and education way to avoid an encounter with a coyote. This year, to date, we've had 98 calls for coyote-related sightings. So our numbers are down considerably. Um, we would love to think, but I'm also not naive, so we would love to think that, that we don't have a problem because of those numbers, but I also know the numbers don't tell us the entire picture. And I do know that about 18 of those calls have come from landmark residents. So that is a particular issue or, or um, a concern for landmark. It's probably the most. We don't track each individual neighborhood, but when I got a call from um, the assemblyman about a week, a week and a half ago, we went through and pulled all those calls and tried to figure out where they came from. And we could attribute about 18 to landmark. Um, and we seem to have a real spike in August around the time Seal Beach had their issues starting up. And I think it, it raised awareness again that we have had problems in the past and that we need to pay attention to the issues here in our community. Um, the council a few years ago, a couple of years ago, made a decision that they weren't going to trap on an ongoing basis. Um, we have still, at times, engaged in trapping of problem animals or problem issues in particular. If you were to call our department today and had an encounter where a coyote became aggressive, became abnormal outside the normal behavior of just seeing one in a green belt, um, there are different things that we do. And trapping is a solution that we may or may not use. It depends on the situation. So it's not off the table for us. It's something that we can use. Um, and it's also something you as a private um, association can do on your property as well. So that's just kind of it from a general perspective uh, of where I, how I view the, the issue right now, but I also obviously am interested in hearing from you all. Um, I also am interested in regional approaches to everything we do. You know, the, the coyotes nor the criminals know the borders of Huntington Beach. They don't realize that when you cross Brookhurst or you cross, you know, um, a different street that you're into a different city or a different jurisdiction. So with that, I can turn it over to somebody else, too. Thank you, Chief. Why don't you go ahead? Mike? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Ryan Drabeck. I'm the director with uh, OC Animal Care. Thank you uh, for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I have to tell you, as I listen to your chief talk, it's, it's very nice to have uh, a police chief and somebody that works with our agency so closely, so well educated on the issue. Um, and the fact that your city is tracking sightings and uh, utilizing methods to try and mitigate some of the issues that come up, uh, you're ahead of the game. And uh, it's a really fantastic thing to say about um, your agency and, and your chief and your city in general. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we do as an agency, obviously in instances, uh, I'll echo as the chief said, uh, in instances obviously where a wild animal, and this falls beyond coyotes, uh, any wild animal is injured uh, or sick, uh, we are the agency to contact. Uh, instances, as the chief uh, spoke about as well, where an animal is acting aggressively, and some of these are done uh, really more case by case uh, towards a human. Uh, we want to know about it. We want to involve the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, in instances like that. Um, our agency should know about it. But we also uh, track sightings and provide that information to the city. Uh, we can also be contacted in those instances if you do see an animal near a green belt or, or coming near your pet or even on your property for that matter. Um, and then obviously instances where wildlife will not leave your property. So they've come into your backyard, and this, again, I, I want to emphasize this is not just coyotes. So, uh, you know, if you have a wild animal that's in uh, your backyard, I'm sure you, uh, anybody here has ever seen a possum or a skunk or anything else, uh, that won't leave your yard, although uh, they leave my yard relatively quickly when, my, when my, let my dog out to go to the bathroom. But uh, some of the other animals, uh, like coyotes, um, there may be a bigger issue. So we are the agency uh, to call in those instances. Uh, what we don't provide in a service that we don't provide, again, and, and I, I'm glad the chief mentioned this, is eradication or, or trapping services. So uh, that's where the city has come in and, uh, and worked to provide those services when necessary and those resources when necessary. Um, another thing that we do and will be doing uh, here relatively quickly in the landmark area uh, is we do have door-to-door -door canvassers. Uh, their primary function is uh, both uh, working to get uh, pets licensed, but also education. Uh, and it's a door-to-door -door service where we provide information such as what the city has, uh, our information brochure, 
on coyotes, uh, which is on our website, and, and I, have, I don't have nearly enough for everybody, but, but certainly I can provide you that info if you'd like. Um, but, uh, you know, really as an effort to go door to door, to door and talk to residents about the issues they've been having, educate them about how they can mitigate those issues uh, on their property um, and, you know, when you're out walking your dogs. So, uh, again, uh, we work very closely with these agencies. In, in any instance, obviously in any emergency, you would contact 911. Uh, and ask, you know, and, and advise them of those types of instances. But uh, in cases where you have questions, hey, I saw this animal, you know, it seems like it's sick or injured or it doesn't have any hair or, you know, I, I thought I heard a growl. Uh, we definitely want to hear about that. We want to make a uh, record of that and document it. Um, you know, we will respond, like I said, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, injured animals, aggressive animals, things like that, uh, towards people, we want to make sure we know about that. So, uh, but again, uh, I do want to echo uh, what I said before about uh, what an educated city you have on this issue and, and the fact that we're really trying to work uh, in partnership with them to, to mitigate a lot of these issues. So that's what I have for right, right now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ryan and Chief and Assemblyman Mansour. Um, Got a lot of stuff to say, but first of all, I, I want to recognize those folks that are here with me tonight. Um, captain Rebecca Hartman, who is this district's captain, and Lieutenant Dave McNair in the corner over there, if you could let them know. <laughs> those particular officers are the ones that are, take the calls for this area, do the investigations. Uh, Lieutenant McNair and Captain Hartman, they were involved in the investigation in Cyprus not too long ago. It's been about a year ago. And they did a great job, as Ryan can attest. It was a difficult situation that happened over there, but uh, they went in and they took care of business and we did a lot of public education. And the white shirts that you have sitting over there, it's my pride and joy, those are our natural resource volunteers. Guys, can you raise your hands up so they can see you all? I've been with the department close to 30 years now, and the greatest, uh, one of the greatest things that I've been involved in is working with volunteers. And it's, it's, I think from a maturity aspect, it's matured me as much in my career as being an officer, obviously, with public safety and working with people. But I, I appreciate the work that the volunteers do. It's, it's kind of a vision and a dream that I've had to see them uh, uh, work with the public. So what I'd like to do tonight is I, I, I've got a few things that I'd like to say. Um, and uh, there's three words that come to my mind right now on why we're here today, because there's going to be a lot of questions. We want to leave time for you guys to ask those questions. But the first one is trust. <clears throat> the second word is accountability. And the third is communication. You folks, uh, I appreciate all of you to come out on a, on a, a midweek night for this. That tells me that there, there are some concerns. And I think one of the things that, that need to come out of this meeting, if anything, that when you leave here, your sense of trust will be with the agency officials will be greater. I say that because I've spoken in a number of these meetings over the years. And as the volunteers can attest, sometimes we leave there and we, we wonder whether or not we've increased the trust between the public and the ag agencies, those people that we represent. The other is accountability. The accountability in this certain sense works as much in, in some cases, and a lot of the time more so with the agencies. And that's where the concept of Wildlife Watch came to be that was developed about five or six years ago. I can talk to you a little bit about the history and then how it evolved and why I believe it's the future of, of uh, public safety wildlife contact, especially in Southern California, but I'd like to see it go statewide. The third area is communication. And so the whole concept in communication that has to do with agencies, how they communicate amongst each other, okay, when they have these types of issues, and how the public is able to communicate with the agencies to build that trust and hold that accountability on both sides. And that's what gets back to uh, the concept of Wildlife Watch, which he actually evolved from the concept of Neighborhood Watch, which was started, I think, back, Chief, back in the 60s? <coughs> yeah. So Neighborhood Watch has, has evolved in law enforcement, and what it does, it enacts the help of the public to be able to work in situations um, to provide information, be eyes and ears for the public, and, and actually 
more so the, the law enforcement agency. So there's a synergistic approach there where they're working together to where the public becomes part of the solution. They feel like they're doing something and there's more gratification and it actually helps the police department or the agency as well. In terms of how this all evolved, um, back in the early, late 70s, I was a young biologist, worked did a lot of scientific seasonal aid work for the department. Became a, uh, I was actually a, a reserve warden for a number of years. And over the years, I saw that the calls would come in uh, on coyotes. I used to work the desk in Long Beach when our office was there. People would call losing pets and whatnot. So I saw a need as, as the years went by, and I actually became an officer in 1990 and promoted to lieutenant. The number of calls that we had continued to increase throughout the years of people that were losing pets, and I realized how personal it became to those folks because from a family basis, when you lose a pet, it's much like losing a family member. Started hitting home to me when I started going out to some of these calls and you know, the parents would be there consoling maybe a five or six year old child that has lost a pet. And they were crying and them coming up to you and say, you know, crying and you just look in their eyes and you say, well, you want to just give them a big hug. Sometimes silence is better than saying words. And so as I saw this evolve over the years and realized that with how the resources had been cut back through law enforcement agencies, through state government, through city and county governments, I realized that there was such a need because the public was at a loss on what to do on some of this and they felt like they were getting passed around from agency to agency on how to handle these because they didn't feel like they were getting their needs met. So the concept of Wildlife Watch was born out of that side and where I'm at in my career right now, my role basically is I'm an educator. I, I, I work in terms of hoping to create leaders that you know, within the community and the agencies to maybe be what we call conservation coaches. So that's my role. That's why I'm here tonight. Uh, my role is to help coach police departments, county agencies, so that we can work together on this issue. Because it's not going to go away, folks. Um, it's going to get better. But we've been trying to eradicate the, the coyote since the early 1900s with bounties, you name it. Uh, whatever they, they did, you know, in terms of killing the animals. Actually, people were going out back in those days for bounties. They were paid for the number of hides that they brought in. Wiley's still around. And I use the term Wiley, um, not to anthropomorphize, you know, this non-game mammal, but in terms that you can think about how smart they are. In terms of, the, the word coyote actually means trickster, all right? It's an Aztec word that, um, there's a book out, it's written by Solving Coyote Problems by John Trout, Jr., and he introduces that in his book. The coyote is probably the most opportunistic and adaptable predator that we have in the United States. And for that reason, he continues to evolve into our ecosystem and has, it, has its change. And over the years, through the industrialization of the United States, during, from World War I, World War II, how we became more mechanized and we changed our, our way of life by taking away their habitat. The coyotes back, you know, in early ages when, when we had hunting, when Orange County had hunting, where there was hunting in the surrounding hills where the coyote had fear. There was a fear base there because they knew that the farmer would come out with a shotgun or a rifle or whatever if he started getting into the hen house. Those days are long past. We don't, we don't have those days anymore. So while he has adapted to the point where he realizes that his fear now where back then, his, the main apex predator was the wolf, okay? The wolf was migrated, generally. We had a wolf, wolf throughout the United States. They were more predominant in, in uh, the Midwest, but actually, the wolf cannot live where there's a lot of people. So as the wolf was eradicated, the coyotes started moving in and they started following man to the west coast. And of course, there was more development. There is a predator we have locally here in Orange County, which you've all heard. We've had some fatalities, which is the mountain lion. Mountain lion do prey on coyotes, okay? But you need to realize that we have an urban edge here in this area that just is so out of balance and it fluctuates that it's, it's not a, a normal population and to do a population study as you would, say, um, a mammal like a deer population or even a predator population. In fact, in our agency, we do not have 
a biologist that studies coyotes per se. Okay, we don't have a dedicated non-game mammal biologist. Um, many of these calls come in. We do confer with our, our biologists. By the way, I'm not an expert. I'm not a wildlife biologist by any sense. My background is in marine biology. I have a degree in marine. But over the years, I've responded to a lot of these types of calls. So the need for uh, better communication, developing trust, is what and accountability on both sides is how the Wildlife Watch concept came about. And I truly believe that it's the future. And uh, a few years ago, I spoke uh, before Chief, I, I can't, uh, Chief Small, I think, was before uh, Chief Handy. Um, uh, the city of Huntington Beach did, did start some Wildlife Watch programs, which they, to this day, they're, they're sending me an email each month. They are tracking the coyotes in certain areas throughout the city, which is effective. But I've given you a little background, okay? But we, and maybe some, it may have answered some of the why questions. Now we're at the point of saying, so what are we going to do? All right? And you folks have taken your time out to be here tonight. Our goal here tonight is to answer your questions, okay? And what I'd like to do is uh, stop at this point and let it open up for questioning, and uh, we'll go to that point. All right? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get to some questions. Um, before we do that, I, um, since I called for this forum, I'm going to take the liberty of asking a couple myself. Um, is there any way to know where the coyote, the coyotes that come to landmark specifically, is there any way to know where they come from? Are they living here, or do they live nearby and come over here? Is there any way to know that? Well, coyotes, coyotes have dens, all right? So they reproduce generally in uh, January and February. So they've learned to move in on the urban edge. You, you in this particular area, you have the, your channels, okay? So as we've developed to, to try to take away that 100-year flood that's coming in, we've got our flood control channels, okay, which is, is a highway and byway for coyotes here in, in, in Huntington Beach. The other areas are Miles Square Park. If you think in terms of what the coyote needs to survive, it's food, water, shelter, and space. And he's, while he's adapted over the years to be able to uh, optimize his growth and reproduction in these various areas, all right, one of them is golf courses, okay, which they've had problems. We, and what we've done throughout, you know, the United States when there's a subdivision, when you build new houses, what do you do, okay? You're creating green belts, okay, for your kids to play in and have opportunities to enjoy and go walking, walk your pets and whatnot. Well, coupled with the fact of how the pet industry has increased over the years, trying to find out where these animals are living, most of the time, in, in answer to your question, is that these animals live in areas where they're going to, when they're denning up, it's generally outside to where they have a minimal intrusion from, from us, where they can hide and not be bothered. So the areas here would be flood control channels, okay? Golf courses and parks. Not to say they're denning up there. Occasionally they'll den up in there, especially in, in, in areas like uh, golf courses. There has been some dens that have been found in Miles Squares over the year. But for the most part, they're gonna be places, I would, I would think more towards um, your, your uh, flood control channels in Santa Ana River. And some of these, you've got some lateral channels that come in from Bolsa Chica that transect this city that, that provides an opportunity for them. Uh, their den, when they den up, they, they go for apron skirts often where the cement will meet the, uh, the uh, uh, soil and they'll, they'll go underneath that. So that's part of what Wildlife Watch does when you've got communities that, that are savvy and they learn a little bit about life history. You got more people learning. Of course, if you do go to where you want to trap, um, that's what they're going to do. They're going to try to locate those dens. Vague, but that hopefully gives you a little bit of answer. And I appreciate that. So to kind of zero in on my question and um, on my approach in terms of asking for a regional approach, if Huntington Beach, or any city for that matter, goes at this alone, we'll have some success, ups and downs. But you mentioned, for example, Miles Square Park and Fountain Valley, flood control channels which go throughout the cities, golf courses, every city almost has a golf course. Do we know more specifically, the ones that are coming, I'm just, I'm trying to get a handle on Landmark specifically with this question. Do we know where they are coming from? Are they coming from Miles Square Park? Are they coming from, any particular area, is it all from Huntington Beach, or is it possible some of them are coming from surrounding cities? Do they travel that far? 
They do, they do travel. They're going to travel where the food is, okay. where it's most available. Remember, the coyote is going to take food where it has to expend the least amount of energy in doing so. And the complex issue of this is that we live in a society today that allows certain things that attracts coyotes where it's legal to do so. And that, in this case, is your feral cat populations. Every city has cats, all right? Domestic or feral, okay? And that's a prime <laughs> food source for coyotes. They look for that. They prey upon these cats. So that's something that you being cat owners out there, keep those cat indoors as you can. Uh, we do not, in answer to your question, Alan, we do, we do not have a specific person that is tracking these, okay. these types within the department. Most of the calls right now go into uh, Ryan's uh, with Orange County Animal Control and through the police department. So both of them are tracking some. We track a little bit, but it would be nice to maybe formalize it so we could team up and uh, share the information. Okay, and one final question um, for now. Um, the coyote, you mentioned uh, uh, an approach in Cyprus when they had a big problem. Did that involve trapping? Well, Dave could probably answer this a little bit better, but there was removal there by okay. euthanasia, and it was done at night. Uh, it needed to be quick because we had a little girl that was actually bitten, and we needed to find out which animal did that, which the, was the offending animal, okay? For the most part, when that's done, it's done uh, humanely. And I'm going to be quite honest with you, in the early 90s when we had these problems, we would go out and we, we'd use firearms when it was safe to do so to remove a few. It's much harder to do that now, all right? In terms of what happened in Cy Cyprus, those were taken with firearms, but it was in an, an area to where they could be removed safely, all right? It's more humane to do that. One of the reasons is, is because we need to locate which animal did it. It's not where we go out and we just try to start eliminating coyotes because we want to do a DNA match, all right? Now, scientifically, we can show which animal was the offending animal, and that's the way we try to address it. The last thing we want to do is have to go out there and start taking out coyotes. That's a last resort. But when it comes to public safety or an imminent threat, we're going to err on the side of human safety. And that's the way the legislature has given us the responsibility and the authority to do that under 1801 of the Fish and Game Code and under 4152 in terms of uh, removal for, for the cities to be able to do that too and make that determination. There's a rabies, Thanks. rabies, responsi There's a rabies responsibility too there that we have to right. determine and make sure because somebody was actually bitten that uh, the animal didn't have rabies. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to open this up to Q&A. So, we have a traveling microphone. Yeah. Is that how we're going to do it? Yeah. Uh, do you want people to line up in the middle, or are you going to take it to them? Take, take it to them. Perfect. I have a question, first, if I may. Um, we've heard that if you eradicate one animal out of a community, the, the pack just replaces it with another animal. Is that true? Did everybody hear that question? OK, the question was a removal of a a coyote from a, a particular, I'm going to call them families because that's basically what they are. So I think in terms of packs with wolves, okay. What happens? The, the studies, some studies show that they're immediately re replaced, okay. Coyotes are very territorial, all right. So when you do remove an animal, there is going to be one mother nature tries to replace itself by moving another animal in there, and that often happens. That's why. If you don't have an educational program that removes attractants in a community and you choose to go for selective removal, all right, the two won't work unless they're working together because you have to remove the food source, all right? It's basic. And that's where the accountability, the trust, and the communication comes within, within both the agencies and us. Uh, now, there are situations where you have animals, for example, there's been studies that have shown that if you remove a, a, an animal, the females will respond reproductively, meaning that their litter sizes will increase. Most of those studies have not been done in an urban area. They've been done in mainly a suburban, outside. But again, the key, if you leave, uh, the takeaway for all of you today is food attractants. No food, they have to move on. Our residents are well educated to that. Uh, my next comment is that we've never known where exactly to report sightings. Um, we've reported them sometimes at the police department. People say it's, a, it's useless, so we don't report anymore. So we would like to have a number and an area where we can do that. 
let me give you a number and, and a contact person, and I will also give you these handouts for the ones I have. But we do have a person that's assigned to manage the animal control contract with the county. We report those numbers. We report them to, to Fish and Game. We do track all of those. Um, the person, you can obviously call dispatch, our non-emergency number, unless it's an emergency, obviously call 911. The non-emergency number is 714-960-8825. But there also is an office number. De Denise Robsell is our administrative services manager, and she is responsible for fielding your calls. She has a voicemail. She takes your calls in the middle of the night and other times when you leave them. It's 714-536-5913, and that's Denise Robsell, and her email is D-R-O-B-S-E-L. So D for Denise Robsell, R-O-B-S-E-L, at hbpd.org. And I'll leave this with you after. But and what you, good will it do to report it? Well, we track them. So if five or six people report all in a very close period of time or they report that they're aggressive, then we send people mm -hmm. out. We contact animal control. We contact game and fish. And then we start talking and working together to do what we can. If Thank need you. be, we bring in a contract trapper, which we have done in the past. There are some difficulties and downsides to that. Um, we have encountered other animals in traps. You might get a domestic animal in a trap. Um, cats injure themselves or kill themselves when they get involved in a trap. They don't relax like the dogs might. Um, there's other issues with trapping that become more complicated than you would think on the face of it. Thank you. And, and, and if I could follow up on that, I really want to emphasize what the chief said about calling and utilizing us as a resource. If you call and if you don't call and don't let us know that there's a problem, everyone's going to think, oh, it's okay, or, or there's far less coyote problems than there have been in the past. But if you let us know, we will be able to track the ups and downs and if there's an increase or not. But without your participation, not your, if, without you letting us know, we're, we're not going to have any idea. It's just like the people that came to speak with me from Landmark uh, in my office. Had you not come and told me about the concern, I wouldn't have known it was this big of a problem. So I need to hear from you and your um, your elected officials, everybody needs, we need to hear from you. So please utilize that. If I can add one more thing to that, I, I think part of the frustration, if you, you had mentioned that you call and you feel like we're doing nothing, one of the things that we tell everybody that calls and we first try to explain is the education effort. And if you look throughout the industry, the predominant thing that is successful is education. Lieutenant Smurl talked about it as well. Uh, food eradication, eliminating food sources, um, using scare tactics, things like that. Um, keeping your animals indoors. Those are things we recommend first, and we always refer you first to our educational materials. And I think that causes some frustration because somebody wants a animal control truck or a police car to respond out, grab the coyote, throw it in the car, and drive off, and you never to see it again. Um, and I think that's in a perfect world. We'd all like to do that. It's just not always perfect. Okay. Um, I think it's important to reiterate what Jeannie said. Uh, the population here in Landmark, all of our residents are incredibly well educated relative to how to protect themselves and, and food and all the issues you're talking about, education. My question is, what constitutes in um, the officials' minds aggressive behavior by a coyote? What is it that they may do or behave that we can recognize as aggressive behavior, report as aggressive behavior, number one. Number two, what case-by-case um, -case circumstances uh, determines whether or not uh, they are to be trapped? And if, in fact, that comes about, is there a cost to the community? That's three questions. I'm done. I'll handle the low, the low hanging question for me of, as far as what constitutes trapping. In our mind, it's when it's a threat to public safety. So if there is um, very aggressive behavior, and I'll let the experts actually define that, but to me, as a non-coyote expert, um, that would be if, if an animal approached you up in your home, if they refused to leave, if they attacked a child, or um, started getting really aggressive towards you and not didn't react normally to humans. Most animals are afraid of humans. Most of them, most coyotes would shy away from a human. If they didn't and started doing other things, we would start getting more and more concerned. And it is not a cost to the community when it's a public safety issue, and we believe it's a public safety issue. If you chose 
as a private HOA to trap or do your own thing because you see a coyote in the green belt. That's would be something you would be responsible for as, a, as an association or as a private entity. But you could probably describe the aggressive behavior a little more articulately than yeah, I could. Yeah, from, <clears throat> from an animal, uh, animal control perspective, I'll, I'll echo uh, what the chief said. I mean, as far as aggressive behavior, it's, it's very difficult to give you a, a comprehensive list of all the case-by-case -case issues that we would respond and try and, you know, work with Fish and Wildlife or what have you to try and capture an animal. Um, you know, just a general eradication services, uh, you know, pets coming up missing, things like that. You know, seeing the animal run across, you know, the green belt, yeah, I mean, an association can provide that service. Um, but generally speaking, I'm, first and foremost, an animal doesn't leave. Uh, and I mean, it's, you know, it's in your backyard, it's just standing there staring at you and, and just won't leave. Absolutely is something we need to know about so that we can come out and handle that type of situation. Um, I can tell you, you know, I've been out uh, riding my mountain bike in some of the hillside areas and had an animal that just wandered right in front of me, didn't look at me. Uh, but just wandered right in front of me and walked right off and had zero fear uh, of me. I didn't do the right thing in that I should have practiced uh, the hazing a bit. Uh, I think I was more in awe uh, that it, you know, just sort of walked right in front of me. But, um, you know, it, it's one of those things that we would have to discuss uh, with you, assuming this is not an emergency. If it's an emergency, 911. Uh, but assuming it's not an emergency, we want to know the circumstances. What happened? Was the animal growling? Was it looking? You, uh, you know, is it not leaving your property? I mean, these are the things that we're going to want to hear to be able to make that decision. I'm going to talk to you in, in terms of, let's say we had a, what I'd like to see happen, okay? Let, let's imagine five, ten years from now where your neighborhood watch program is working. Like, we, we've got it started in Huntington Beach, but we, we could definitely improve it. It's working with your wildlife watch program, where in wildlife watch you, are, you will all be taught this level, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through and I'll answer your question, the levels of aggression in coyotes. What, what is imprinting, what, what's a habituated coyote, okay? When will the Department of Fish and Wildlife respond, okay? What we do as an agency, all right, so let's, let's talk in terms of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. When our officers respond, that means there's been physical contact made with the, with the animal. There's either been a bite or a scratch, or there's been contact made, we call that a, a type red. We have three levels in our department. Green is a sighting, okay, where the coyote is spotted in, in the community and it's not showing any terms of aggression in terms of hanging around or habituation, all right. And just going down a street, okay, even though during midday it's, we don't want to see that because coyotes are nocturnal or crepuscular by nature. Night meaning uh, nocturnal, crepuscular meaning early dawn hours, okay. Now, Coyotes that, um, in terms of what we, the sighting is, is a green, an imminent threat for us, okay, is when an officer responds to either a bite or where there's a coyote that has got onto a school ground, okay, and he's there on site, it's an in-call progress, uh, we will respond, but generally what happens is your law enforcement official is there because it's a 911 call, generally they're first, and then we, but we want to know about those types of things. When they do an investigation, all right, and they determine that the totality of facts in that investigation, that there's a high likelihood that somebody's going to get better injured, then we come in. Now, the way it's been for the last number of years is when there's an attack, okay. Now, what you consider the difference is that when you lose a pet, okay, and mind you, if a coyote came into my yard and took my pet, okay, I would probably be, have the same feelings that you do, I, would, I, I wouldn't be happy. I'd be upset, okay? But that is not an imminent threat in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, all right? Unless it comes into the house, okay? Or it gets in a situation where an officer responds, either an officer from Huntington Beach Police Department or an animal control officer, and this animal does not leave. Maybe it's sick, okay? Oftentimes these coyotes, they can carry mange, okay, sarcoptic mange. Sometimes they have distemper. They're generally not the rabies carrier like your bats and your skunks in Orange County are, but occasionally. We haven't had, or I don't think we've had any. Okay, but those are the things that, so if an animal is sick, okay, that could affect how it's reacting to you. For example, laying, laying out, I, somebody showed me a picture a while ago when I first came in. A coyote was under a bush. He said he got within 15, 20 feet of the thing. That tells me one thing, it's either sick or it's habituated beyond to where there's a problem. Somebody's feeding it. 
And every neighborhood has a feeder, whether it's intentionally or unintentional. And that's the, that's the concept of Wildlife Watch, is to get you guys looking out for each other, all right? And reporting to your agencies, not necessarily to be a snitch, but working with your neighbor. It could be Mrs. Jones, who lost her husband, you know, a few years back. And she's sad. She's going into depression. Many people will relieve that by feeding wildlife. They get, they get a gratification from it. In terms of how our culture has changed anthropomorphically, we look at animals different than we did in the past. It's changing, okay? We have talking animals on the screen. Many things in our culture has changed on how people relate to wildlife. Now, in terms of during the day for, for coyote behavior, there's been several studies that have been done, and I encourage you to go online, okay? Um, but one of them was done by Baker and Tim. And I look at their studies that they have done, and basically what it says is that when coyotes start getting out during midday, and they start hanging or frequenting areas like parks, recreational areas, or school areas, okay, and not showing any fear where people are present, especially kids, that's a problem, okay? And we need to know that kind of stuff. Okay. 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 Well, that's good that we brought it up here. So we're learning. Okay. That's not good that it's happening all the time. So, well, right now, we, we, we just addressed that. We can, oh, if you didn't get that before you leave here, we'll make sure you get that. But that's why we're going to bring it, bring in, bring in this up. Okay. I have a few statements to make and um, questions. Uh, I've lived in Huntington Beach 45 years. Years ago, we had no coyotes. We didn't have any animal problem. And I hear a lot of talking, but I see no action. Uh, is that right? Uh, the, uh, my, I'll give you my picture of my prize cat that I just lost about two weeks ago. And uh, I found him the next morning. He wanted out. I reluctantly let him out. That's what I found after. And then I had to go pick him up. Now, OK, when you trap these animals, what do you do with them? The animals are humanely euthanized. They were not relocated. What do you do with them? They're humanely euthanized. You euthanize them? Yes. OK. We don't turn them loose somewhere in another neighborhood. <laughs> no, no, these are great questions you're bringing in. I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. Uh, that's, that tells us quite a story in those pictures. Well, when I was in Wyoming, we'd have a coyote kill. We'd go out and we'd shoot them, we'd cut off their ears, take them, bring them back, and we'd get paid by the ears. And we didn't have any coyotes. Very, very few. Sir, I, I, I appreciate your question. Our, our animals are more important than a coyote, definitely. And, and we're getting kind of hot about it. And I'm glad we had this meeting because I've been waiting for a meeting like this. So that's basically what I've got to say. Thank sir, you. Sir, I, I appreciate your question, and I'm sorry for your loss. And I'm sure all of us up here are. And I know there's some frustration and some expression that there is no fear uh, from the coyotes here. And I think it's good that we are all hearing that. I am going to follow up with this. I'm not going to let go of this issue, OK? My door is going to be open to each and every one of you. I'm going to follow up with this. But I think this is a first step tonight that everyone here hear how bad it is or your concerns specifically in Landmark so that we can follow up on these. I'm making lots of notes so we can follow up with this. And I'm willing to meet with you in the future so that we do have some type of tangible results. Um, that is going to be one of my questions for tonight. How do, how do we quantify our results and whether we're making progress? But thank you, sir. And we're going to turn it on to the, other, next, to the next question. I'd like to say, uh, how far can we go? We've had coyotes in the, in the cul-de-sac after dark at night. How far can we go to take care of them? How far, as a, as a homeowner, how far can we go? What do you mean, take care of them? Take care of them? Well, I think that's pretty obvious. OK, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you're asking I, what the penalty is, sir. Pardon? What the yeah. penalty is. Yes, what's the penalty? You can't take a firearm out in the street and shoot a coyote. If a coyote is attacking you. I can't you, shoot him? No, you cannot. I can't shoot him. Not in the city. I can't can. club him to death. Well, I can't, say that. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't do nothing to them. 
but chase them down the road to some other. We haven't got a cat left in Huntington Crest. Not one cat. You, you cannot shoot a coyote in the city because it's coming after a cat. That's just, the, our laws aren't set up that way. Um, pardon me? The penalty could be prison. So it's a felony and, and it could be prison. You put me in jail for shooting a coyote. I could. Okay, absolutely. Here, I'm going to jump in here because because I've been. This is about my 25th. The coyotes are more important than our pets. Thank you. No, uh, let, let me make a couple things because you got a good point. I understand. Uh, what happens is when you know we re react emotionally. If a burglar came into your your house, you would do what you had to do to protect your family. But the thing of it is, is you don't know where that bullet's going, folks. That's the reality of it. And if that bullet was to hit a, a young child or something like that. That's what you're up against. There's a liability issue. That's why these laws are put into, into effect. Um, when, 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 when we start the Wildlife Watch program, one of the things they learn is how to haze coyotes, all right, and how to run them out with baseball bats, okay? How to look, look larger and drive that animal. You, you talk to any one of the white shirts over there, and they'd be more than happy to give you some, some techniques on how to haze a coyote. And if you get any, anything else besides removing attractants, when a coyote comes into your neighborhood, don't let it go away without showing some, some sort of a reaction to it that puts some fear into it. David, do you want to put the mic in the middle and let people come up? Sure. And that way one or two I can... Do just, I do just want to make one more statement about, uh, sir, you had indicated that coyotes were more important than cats. That's not, or your pets. That wasn't the point I was trying to make, but the danger of taking a gun out into the city and into your neighborhood does far outweigh saving your cat is, is what my point was. Yeah, uh, good evening. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm uh, Dayton LaGrua, one of the board members. Uh, also, I have the uh, Property Protection Committee. I'd say probably frequently um, we have, I see incident reports coming through from our um, officers at the gate of uh, coyote sightings where people have called or we've sent our rover out to uh, help possibly to uh, haze a coyote. Uh, several times, it's more than one. I've had instances where they've had calls of as many as three or four that they've had to uh, send the rover out to uh, try to uh, disband and chase down. What I want to know is, is it OK for me to go ahead and have the officer taking that report to go ahead and, at that time, also call in on your uh, city phone number to uh, make that uh, in addition to telling the person that calls in to also call you. Yes. We would like that call. So we would like to know when you see a coyote here, yeah. what time of day it is, that type of thing. Right. If it's not an emergency and it's just a sighting, I would prefer the office number instead of tying up our dispatchers. Certainly. Um, but if it's something that we need to respond to, obviously call 911. Okay. So I can make sure then that they have that phone number there and make, make sure that a part of their regular procedure that whenever anybody sees a coyote and reports it, they will call you and uh, give you a, uh, a notice of the uh, sighting. Yes, I just okay. want to make clear, though, we don't respond to all sightings. Just understand that, but at I least sure. you will be uh, seeing, uh, hopefully, documenting this and we hopefully do. an increase in sightings that you haven't been seeing before. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lisa McCurdy. Uh, I live in Garden Grove, and you're probably wondering what I'm doing here. But uh, I've lived in Garden Grove for over 50 years. Uh, never even heard mention of coyotes until about two years ago. And since then, several of my family members, several of my friends, have, their pets have been victims to these coyotes. We actually had three living at, our, at Bell Junior High School on Springdale. They took up residence there. The city. It's the west side of Garden Grove that borders to Seal Beach, and I know you've probably heard a lot about Seal Beach in the paper lately. So we, the residents were up in arms, tired of their pets being mutilated, sometimes before their eyes, went to city council, did the meeting. Luckily, the council and the mayor especially was very supportive. They immediately hired a trapper. They got rid of those three coyotes at Bell Junior High School, and the animal deaths didn't entirely stop, but they dropped drastically. So now Seal Beach ha was having this horrible problem. I've talked to a couple dozen people last night that see coyotes on a daily basis there. Talked to several people whose pets were killed. One lady 
Coyote fo in Leisure World, Coyote followed her into her house, took her dog out of the house in front of her. She was, you'll probably see her still on the news tonight. She was there last night. Um, it's been really bad in Leisure World. And because Leisure World is privately owned, they hired a trapper uh, about a week or two ago. And as far as I know, they've only caught one, but they have caught a coyote. Um, so last night was a city council meeting at Seal Beach. And uh, they did vote to start trapping coyotes as of today. So Seal Beach is trapping the coyotes. And I was pretty amazed because there was three councilmen present in that meeting, and all three councilmen, one by one, told their own personal story about their interaction with coyotes. Because they say the number one thing to do, and I have always agreed with this, is to haze that coyote, is to scare it away. And that's what you're supposed to do. These coyotes, in Seal Beach anyway, they're no longer afraid. Every single councilman, one in particular said, he had a golf club in his hand. He yelled and screamed, chasing the coyote down the street. The coyote would run right out of his reach, stop, turn around and look at him. He'd chase him some more. He would st They're not afraid. And a lot of times they stand up to you and growl. So there's definitely a need for education. I don't think tonight is the big educational night that we're supposed to be spending a lot of time on it. This is a town hall meeting to hear from the citizens. Uh, but we definitely need, ed need education. Things like leaving pet food out, people need to know that's the worst thing you can do. Because I, I hate the thought of killing them too. Now, the reason for this meeting, as I understand it, is to get a regional gathering, a group, to get everybody to work together. Because last year, Garden Grove did it on their own. Today, Seal Beach started doing it on their own. But we need to come up with a plan where all these neighboring cities work together trap maybe at the same time every year or every two years. You know, there's places that have deer that are overrun by deer. They have hunting season. You're issued hunting licenses. You're allowed to kill a certain number of deer, which I don't like that idea either, but that's how those people have to do it. And at least the deer aren't ripping their dogs and cats apart and coming into their houses. So my question is not for the panel. Because I'm really not familiar what your interaction with coyotes is around here, my question is for you guys. I would like to know how many of you, either yourself or someone that you're close to, has had a pet either attacked or killed by a coyote. Could you raise your hands? OK, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Um, quick question for the panel. Um, um, Kent, uh, maybe this is, question is for you, but I, I know when someone expressed, or a lot of people have expressed tonight, there's no fear in these coyotes. So when that becomes known, what is the response? Does our response level change? And I appreciate the gentleman's question. I really do. And I'm trying to get to the heart of it. So what would be the response if that was the case? Well, in terms of agency response, it's nothing different than we've talked about here. A coyote that's showing no fear is a coyote that's been imprinted or habituated to the point where something's got to take place. Either it needs to be removed, okay, because if, if it continues, it's going to continue to get rewarded because you're going to show more fear and that animal is going to. It gets to a point where something has to be done. So, so you said it has to be removed. That would mean trapping. That would be up with, with the, and that's the whole purpose of this coalition right. tonight. Okay. That's, Fair enough. That's uh, the agencies can, you know, I'm here as a, a coach. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is not going to come in and remove these coyotes for you. We're here. We will if there's an attack or an imminent threat that we talked about earlier. But again, you got, this is not unlike what's going on in the other cities. And uh, it's great. I took some, I've been taking notes and what she just said is great about, we had about uh, 12 people raise their hands to lost pets. Uh, it's a considerable number. Uh, I'm Mimi Tanaka. I live here and have lived here for a couple of years. And prior to living here, I lived in the Glendale area in a canyon. And we had a really significant coyote problem there. Uh, you know, they would walk down the streets like they owned it. And the same thing is happening here. They just walk down the street like they own it. And 
the, the unusual thing that happened when I lived in Glendale was that I had two neighbors. One of them was uh, a um, animal trainer in the film industry, and he had a domesticated wolf. And the wolf would walk around with him on the chain, and you know, uh, Willow would pee all over the neighborhood. And as soon as that wolf peed all over the neighborhood, and they really saw that it was a real wolf, the coyotes disappeared for three years. And, and I have made that suggestion to people, but you know, being because I'm a renter and not an owner, you know, I just thought, well, you know, what do I input do I have? But you know, it's it's. I wish I would have saved that guy's car, but card. But but you know, there are probably are people. I don't know how feasible it is in terms of uh, money, or if somebody who regularly came with a domesticated wolf or a couple of domesticated wolves and showed their faces and peed and you know did whatever. Would it deter? Would it be a deterrent? That's my question well, to to you. And and then I have another comment. To to address that. There are a lot of solutions or people putting ideas forward, whether it's on the internet or at some of these town halls and so forth. And I don't want to discount any option. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, yes, I do want a regional approach. And I think that's going to take a little bit of time to put together. What I do want to do is, at least for Landmark in the very near future, set up a time to do a walkthrough with a couple of the residents and maybe some of the management of the facility and see what we can do here in Landmark. And because this is private property, so there's some things that we can do that Landmark can do, and there's some things that the other agencies could do. So we can extend an invitation to uh, you know some of the panelists here tonight, Chief, to walk through with us. And I think that would be a good first step to identify some things clearly at Landmark that we can do to address the situation. So I think that's a definite follow-up, and we can discuss the individual suggestions. But specific to your question, I'll allow my, if the panel wants to address it. I there's, a lot of, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things out there. I think what each of you can do, and you think in terms of the coyote, what you can do for your individually, here's another takeaway for you. Ammonia water. Any time that you can remove the scent off your property that's coming off, the coyotes, the, their olfactory sense in their brain is highly developed. They can smell up to a mile away. They, and they know in advance if you've got a pet because they can smell it, so they can pick up. So any scent that you can, especially for you, those of you that have, have pets, um, that would be a good start. You know, I, I've heard of wolf urine. It makes, it makes biological sense. but. It, I, I have no comment on whether or not it works because oh, I don't know. Okay, the ammonia water, you like set it in a jug and set the jug outside or no, you spray no. it or what do you do? This is what uh, a lot of the people are doing now is they'll take a mild solution and they'll get some rags, okay? And what they'll do is they'll, they'll saturate the rags in maybe three or four buckets in different entry points where if a coyote's been on a fence or it's coming in like that and they'll let it sit there, all right? Yeah. And what it does is it, it sends out that it's, it's kind of a deterrent, not only to, to coyotes, but also to wildlife. The thing of it is, is that you need to think in terms of the scent that's coming off your property, whether it's your pet, your, your, the urine of your pet, okay? A male or uh, a, a female, male cat spraying, could be a female in, in, uh, uh, that's ovulating. You know, it's a number of things. They pick up on that, yeah. and they're very territorial, from, so. Okay, my other question, and then I'll stop, is that I had gone out of town on vacation, and my brother was walking my dog from uh, 613B to where I live at 1016C. So that's a half a block at night, about 11 o'clock. He sensed that there was something following him and turned around about 30 feet away was a coyote kind of stalking my dog because he was walking my dog. And um, so does that count as a call? Should I make a call to say, you know, okay, a sighting, Yes, it was following me. It didn't attack or bite, but you know, where does that fall? Because they're around and stalking. From, from my perspective, that is a call of a sighting. That's one that we log. We log the details of each one of them. So we have a narrative that goes along with the sighting. And it would say, you know, that followed our dog, whether it was at night or during the day. Yeah. And we would report that to Fish and Wildlife. And if we got four or five of those on the same street, you know, within two or three nights of each other, then we would call animal control and we'd send somebody out. 
yeah. or we would come out or we would contact you back. Um, a call here and there in and by itself just like that probably wouldn't initiate any of our agencies' right. response. You're going to get a lot of calls from here because they're around everywhere. Every night, every day. Yeah. All right, thank you. A couple things in response. Uh, retractable leases, not a good thing. Shorten your leases down to six feet. I'm sure uh, Ryan would agree with that. Keep it's the law. You, 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 don't, you, want, you don't want a retractable lease. The other thing for communities um, that some, we spoke out in Bel Air, what they did, they, we had a community response similar to this. Um, they're using air horns. The air horn isn't as much to scare away the coyote as it's to let your neighbors know that there's one in the area so they can come out and haze it, all right? So when you get an air horn or some, when, and if you, if you set up a wildlife watch program and you decide to do that, that's one of the things that they'll, they'll emphasize that, that you do. Hirsch, I moved into Huntington Beach three months ago, and I have. Okay, I moved into Huntington Beach three months ago, and I have twice been within six feet of a coyote when walking my dog. I have hazed, and the coyote has gone away. I live not in this neighborhood, but at Saybrook and Edinger. I also learned of a neighbor who had a coyote jump his fence when he was outside with his dog on a six-foot leash. He had a cane and beat the dog off, or beat the coyote off, and after you know, thousands of vet bills, the dog was saved. Uh, my concern is now, it's not just our pets, but our elderly citizens that are at risk when they have to beat off coyotes, and, you know, to, to uh, protect our citizens, if it's a domesticated dog, they're picked up and they're euthanized if they're not on a leash. Why is it that these coyotes are able to haunt our neighborhoods and make it so that it's not safe to go outside your home? I don't believe that we had that report specifically. We've had eight reports of animals that have been killed by coyotes uh, this year out of those 90-some calls. We've had eight across the city. I'm certain that there are more based on what you're telling me and based on what I've heard even anecdotally in the last couple of weeks since the issue has really come back up. Um, if we have an aggressive encounter, that is an aggressive encounter in the backyard. That is something we'd work with animal control on. We'd call. We'd try to decide what our response is. We would look at other sightings in the area. Um, when we talk about a case-by-case -case basis, that's something that deserves a little bit more attention from us. That doesn't mean that we're going to come out and put a trap in your yard tomorrow, but it does mean that we are going to start trying to coordinate and look and see what it is we can or can't do. One of the things that uh, in Wildlife Watch is if you go through the class, it teaches you how to uh, separate emotion from fact. And that's what's very difficult to do when you've lost a pet or you've got a coyote because you're living in fear. But the reality of it is, is that we're humans. And I'm not saying it didn't happen, because I've been, I've, this is probably the 25th community meeting that I've spoke at. I feel your pain. The reality of it is, is that there's gonna come a point in time where something needs to be done. And this testimony that you're giving here tonight, don't think it's going on deaf ears. You've, you've got, you've got a legislator, you've got your chief of police, you've got Department of Fish and Wildlife, you've got animal care here listening to what you're saying. We have a saying in, in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, in our, in our, it's called people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I'm telling you folks that we care, but we need your help. They can hire and they can do all the trapping they wanna do, but if you folks don't get together and decide that the coyotes are not gonna live there and you become a part of the solution through learning how to haze, learning how to talk to each other and bring awareness, folks, I'm here to tell you, it's probably not going to happen. We're going to be back here three years from now. I don't want to see that happen, but that's a reality. So we're here to support you. Go ahead. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Jody Jansen. I'm an animal behaviorist. I found out about this meeting a little late. So I would training dogs all day. I found out about it and I came over here just to offer a few suggestions. Certainly, I think it's terrible that anybody's pet got taken by a coyote. 
I know that can be a very heart-wrenching, terrible thing to have to live with. There are a lot of things you can do to protect your pets. But I know that overall there's a problem with the coyotes, that people are feeling a problem with the coyotes. As things gain more momentum, the stories get bigger and the coyotes get more brazen. And so something has to be addressed so that people can feel a little more comfortable and that somebody is doing something. But I don't think certainly trapping with snares and killing them is the answer. They're, they're gonna kill a few and there's still gonna be a problem. So I think there are ways and there are solutions. If I had had a little more time, I would have constructed a better plan, but I can offer some of the suggestions. And the one lady that was up here before me did mention it when there was a wolf in the neighborhood and the wolf scented throughout the neighborhood. Now you don't have to have a wolf to go and scent through a neighborhood. You have to have it strategically done like at, at the divides like on Ellis where they can be moved back into a certain situation. But what is needed is the scent of any larger predator. Any larger predator. And you can get scent online because people do that in hunting all the time, get scents. You can readily buy bear scent. You can buy an exotic cat scent. It can move them really far back into where you want them to be moved. It's a much more humane, decent thing for us to do. As I said, I feel terrible for the people that lost pets. I dedicated my life to working with pets and to working with animals. But trapping them and killing them is just not the solution. And so there are some other offerings as far as doing something like that, doing the scenting, probably a lot cheaper. But also there might be a little population control depending on where and how they can be moved back into like in Newport Coast where they are prevalent, they can be moved back into an area where they can just live and not come into our space as much because there's more land there. There's also things like uh, drugs like Depo Provea, for example, that could, there could be feeding stations. What that would do to help thin the population a different way is it stops the female from cycling. So there, they would not be procreating. They would still get to live their lives. They would be pushed back by scent because that scent will scare them a lot. And, um, and perhaps looking into doing something like feeding stations with Depo Probea done the right way so that the females are not cycling. So there's not being, you know, a steadily bigger and bigger community of coyotes. Okay, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna turn that into a question and we're gonna, uh, so I'm gonna address that question to, to Kent Smurl, then we're gonna go on to the rest of our questions. Kent, is that a solution that, uh, to, to keep the females from reproducing? No, that's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna address relocation first because we're trying to create fear in the coyotes. It's against the Department of Fish and Wildlife policy to relocate any right. animal, okay? No trapping, it's not gonna happen in relocating. So that's not gonna be an option here, folks. Why, okay? First of all, it's inhumane. You move an animal to an area that it's not used to, they're territorial, they'll fight to the death. Number two, you're, you're moving an animal that has a different antibodies within it from a disease standpoint, you could be inoculated in a whole different population in another area. Not good biological wildlife management. So that's not gonna happen with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's against our, our policy. We are not gonna do that. In terms of the feeding stations, we are not going to do something like that. And I'll tell you why. Because we're trying to eliminate the contact. We want them to have fear. We do not want them to associate any food of any type with humans, that's the whole problem that we have. What we're trying to do is create fear in these animals because the wild mother nature's screaming right now. She's got, she's, she's got a lot of pains right now because basically what she's saying is that you messed up what I started in the beginning. I wanted them to have fear of man to be able to eat what I put out there for them to eat in terms of rodents, small non-game mammals. Now they've adapted to eating our food 
and we've got to retrain them. So that's what the hazing does and the removal of the attractants, all right? You need to think in terms of an ecosystem where it's all, it's networked and, and it's, it's working together in one fine plan. Right now, it's so out of balance that we're, we're, we're groping at straws and looking for, for ways to find a solution. But we're not, we're not gonna find that solution until we learn our basics, our responsibility, and that's to remove food, water, and shelter. When we do that, okay, sure. then we're gonna get into the behavior that you've been studying all these years about. Okay, then we're gonna get somewhere, all right? But the reality of it is you've got a wily coyote that has, has been studying us more than we've been studying him. And he's taking advantage of that. Hopefully that answered. In terms of sterilizing of animals, uh, I, I, I it's can't It's not a complete sterilization. What it does is it would cause them not to procreate for a period of time. And it could be redone. But there are things like that. And I was not, um, just to clarify, I was not going for relocation. I know that doesn't work in their territorial. But if scent is placed in certain areas without us relocating, they have to move off and find their own space, which will work out better than putting one coyote in the middle of where another pack is. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes on all of this, and so, feel free to let me know. I want so to make what I'm saying is push them back. Not relocate them. I get you. You can't relocate them. But you can create a boundary where civilization is, and it can be enough where people won't cite them nearly as much. A lot of the sightings are happening right now in the last two months, especially because of the heat level. Okay. And they're coming uh, in more and more for water. I, ap also, I appreciate that. I, I am going to interrupt because we're taking notes. We're going to try to address all these solutions. I want to make sure others get their questions answered, please. We have other people that want to ask. So if you have a final question. Can I say two more quick little things? Please, please start to wrap it up. I can also give tips to individual people for when they are out walking their dog and they see a coyote so that they stop becoming so brazen and wanting to be around people. You can throw a chain straight at it, a choker chain straight at the coyote and people can do it in their neighborhood and they can start making them fearful. I can proof a house. And, so and I think that's part of what uh, Kent was saying about hazing. I think that's a suggestion he made, and I appreciate that. We're going to try to look at all options. I'm not removing any options from the table. I appreciate your questions, your comments. I really want to have to go on to the next person asking a question. There's a lot of people that want to ask questions tonight. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ron Shelton, and uh, I run a neighborhood watch in Fountain Valley, uh, RD43 is what it's called. Uh, we had Kent out to our neighborhood watch, and he did a presentation on coyotes in August of 2011. Kent was out there. Uh, we have learned a lot about coyotes. Now, I've been running a neighborhood watch since 2008. I have 340 people signed up for my neighborhood watch in my quarter section. That's over 60%. Okay, a coyote comes in our area, we know it. The person seeing it tells me I put out a notice and we get, the, everyone knows the coyote's there. Kent's on distribution for the notices. So are all the city councilmen. So are the city manager and the assistant city manager, the chief of police, and three of his top officers, and their whole neighborhood watch organization. It works. Okay. Hazing works. Okay. What do you do when you see a single coyote and you're walking your pet? You raise your arms, you make yourself large, you make noise. Mm. If you can't make noise, get a boat horn with an air compressed bottle and just push the button. And that'll do it. Well, okay. okay. If you see multiple coyotes, get the hell out of there. Okay? 
don't run away, but, but you, you, you can't do it with multiple coyotes. Sir, and I appreciate the comments. It sounds like from what I hear you're saying, you're saying you had a method or a system in Fountain Valley that seems to be working. Uh, Seal Beach is taking some action. They voted on some action last night. We heard about some uh, success in Cyprus. I want to take these and apply these. I want to start with a walkthrough of Landmark with the chief and with some other people so that we can start to really get a handle on this. It's not going to all be solved tonight. I think there are many solutions. Um, you know, so anyways, and once we have that down in Landmark, I think we can start to network and do a more regional approach. So I appreciate, I'm glad to hear some success stories. I'm hearing some concerns, but I'm also hearing some ways of success that have been expressed by you and the previous speaker as well. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. The, the plan that is going on in Seal Beach, okay, is not going to work. Okay. Okay, for one thing, the military force is not going to support that. And they have a big open area where the coyotes are, are, are living. Okay, and they don't want to get rid of the coyotes because the, that keeps the birds down. It doesn't interfere with their air flights. So guess what? They're going to keep the coyotes. And the coyotes are going to breed and move into the areas where the coyotes have been removed. Okay. That's, again, to my point, that's why I want to try to have a regional approach with some communication. That's my goal to try to get this started. So I very much appreciate that. I'm going to stay on top of this issue as long as I'm in elected office, and I'm going to keep after it to try to get a solution. Okay, one last thing. There is a product called Roller Guard. I'm going to give you the pamphlet. I've seen it. it. Okay, it's expensive, but it fits landmark. Okay, because Landmark has a fence around it all the way around. Okay, this keeps the coyotes out. Coyotes cannot jump a fence as high as what Landmark's fence is. They pull themselves over. That's right, but if you put a roller guard on there, they can't put their paws up and it rolls off. Okay, thank you, sir. Please, please leave that with us. We'd like to take a look at it. Our next question, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Martin. I'm with Coyotes in Orange County, and I've been tracking coyotes for a few years now. And I was wondering, of the 18 calls that did come in from Landmark, is there a pattern as to where these sightings and attacks are occurring? Is, did, you notice, is, did you notice where the sightings occurred? No, there wasn't a pattern. Um, and I didn't have enough detail in all of them to put a pattern together that was there. It was individual sightings. Um, there was a, about 13 that came in a short period of time, mainly in about five-week period during August. Which uh, is the busiest season, right. It's the busiest month of the year for coyotes. Yes. Uh -huh. And again, also we thought it was the weather and water. Um, it's a little more challenging for us as well with such a big private community. You get a lot of benefits when you put up a private community and you have a guard gate up front and, and there's a lot of things that the city does or doesn't do when you have a private community as well or what we can and can't do. This is private property in here. So right. it's a little bit more restrictive for us in, in what we come in and do as well. Okay. All right. I just wanted to see if maybe there was a pattern there that you could, you there know. There isn't. There no. wasn't. I'm All sorry. Right. What, what was your name again? I'm Deborah Martin. And Deborah, you say you've been tracking the, the, these calls that are coming? I didn't catch We one. have our own tracker. We have a live tracker. I'm with Coyotes in Orange County, California. Is, and is we a have a live audience? tracker on Facebook where people can data enter track, you know, sightings and Great. attacks right on to the live tracker. And you can query by zip code. You can query by city um, to see what attacks have occurred. But of course, it's, it's just as anywhere else. We rely on those people who are willing to report the trackings. They have to be able to report the trackings to us. It's only the information that's reported to us. And unfortunately, we've learned most people don't report sightings and attacks. So, so are, in your opinion, are they reporting it just on Facebook on this tracker, or are they reporting yes, we, it to state and county officials also? We have, um, uh, we have encouraged them to report to their cities as well. Um, the city was providing us with information. We were actually obtaining the information from animal care directly. We would request reports. And um, then the city made that, at least my city of Fountain Valley, made it a little more difficult to get those reports due to um, 
staffing cuts and what have you. But um, yes, we have a live tracker. It's on Facebook. We have hundreds of followers. And we have people who report the sightings and attacks, but it's only as good as those people who are reporting those sightings right. and attacks. So the information, of course, is skewed because it's not the whole picture. We're only getting a portion of what is um, reported to us. And from what I understand, of the 18 that, or 19 that were reported here, there are a lot more that were unreported. So, you know, in, in order to really get an idea of what's going on in the area, you need everyone to report every sighting, every attack. Yeah, okay? Thank, Thank you. you for the work you do, Deborah. Actually, I have a question for this lady. Um, you all seem very surprised that this was in existence. Do you, does your organization work with officials and share the information that you get with them? Our information is available to anybody who wants to go on our website. It's there for everyone. We cross each other. Because it seems like we're talking about a community getting together and working together, and we have little splinters of people but, who are doing And that's things. part of why I'm taking this on. Yeah. I think there's been some different approaches in different areas. I kind of want some type of one-stop shopping. I know there's, there isn't always a, the, the same solution in every area. Gentleman mentioned Seal Beach and the base out there. That presents a completely different dynamic than one, what you might have here in Landmark. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm suggesting a walkthrough. And I'm going to ask David Taylor, my office over here, to coordinate with Landmark and uh, Chief Handy and um, Kent and Ryan, if you want to join us. Um, with some of the management here to start out at least with a walkthrough of Landmark to see what we can and cannot do. I'm going to talk with elected officials in our county and try to network and make a more regional approach. Maybe mm -hmm. it'd be more effective if, you know, Seal Beach works with Cypress and Garden Grove or Los Alamitos. Huntington Beach works with Fountain Valley, wh whatever. We're going to have some different approaches, mm -hmm. but I think information is key. I'm not opposed to some trapping if it is effective. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to do that. I want, I want some tangible results, but this is the start of an ongoing solution, because no matter what you do, I think um, uh, Kent mentioned that you, know, you don't want the problem to come back two or three years down the road. Right. So I will follow up on this. It's my intent to yeah. do that. And I'm not a landmark resident, although I really appreciate this forum being put together. I live off of Newland and Slater area. And just two weeks ago, we had a very violent attack and killing of a cat in the driveway of one of our homes. And as has been reported, these coyotes are fearless. I, my husband has come out at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, seen them walk, tried to scare them in a number of ways, and they just look at you like, what are you going to do about it? You know? And I don't know if I misheard some information, but you had said when you have a coyote who is appearing to be too comfortable, it needs to be removed. However, you won't come out unless there's an attack. Was that, am I misunderstanding? Well, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we respond when there's an imminent threat or an attack on a human. And by, an attack is not an attack on a pet. That's okay. on a human. The key is, is what, as what we try to do in, in our agency, what I'm trying to do, is coach the cities and the counties into developing public safety wildlife policies within their agencies so they can clarify what is an imminent threat in their particular communities. And, mm -hmm. and it's, very, it's very subjective. It's, mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing to do. So, but that, that's where the importance of working with the community and having them have this training so they can report and develop what we talked about earlier, mm. that trust, okay, the confidence, and have accountability on both sides and improve the communications. Right. Um, and I understand that they're nocturnal animals because we see them mostly between maybe <coughs> 2 and 6 a.m. Um, but as they become more comfortable, I get a little concerned because we have an elementary school in our track. Where are they going during the daytime and what's we addressed that earlier. Generally, they are nocturnal. 
but during the day when they become diurnal, it's more of a concern when they're out just during, during the daylight hours, but they're getting too comfortable, all right? Have we identified where they go? I mean, do you know where they kind of hang out during the daytime? They're going where the food is, okay? In this area here, when there's a lot of habitat, meaning there's shrubs and areas that they can uh, hole up during the day to, to be, you know, cool off. Mm -hmm. But generally, when they're in January and February is when mating takes place, all right? This early spring and, or spring and early summer is when they're, they've had their pups. Mom's going to be a little bit more aggressive. She's going to be out having to feed them when she weans them. Gestation mm -hmm. period is about 60 days, all right? So you've got a period of mid to late summer where those pups are going to be taken out and she's going to train them, all right? So her goal is, is to get them out on their own, just like, you know, what we do with our own kids. Right. Well, what happens is when the food is plentiful, okay, they hang around. It's like the teenage boy that doesn't want to go off to college or go to school. He wants to, <laughs> it's too comfortable. Well, and that's what I wonder about, too. You get second and third generation cubs who are even more and more comfortable. Exactly. And, and we're talking now 15th, 16th, 18th, 20th generations, how it, they just get a little bit more bolder and bolder. So we're going to reinstitute that fear factor into these populations so they realize when they see men, okay, that they're going to show some fear. Now, that as, as they die off through natural mortality, which here is basically getting hit by a car, mm -hmm. okay, or getting uh, injured somehow, um, but when they're fed good, when they're eating a lot of cats and they're getting, like the coyote that I saw here in this complex, a picture that was taken, that coyote was <coughs> fat. So fat that you could see it when it was sitting there. It's eating way too good. Somebody's feeding it. Right. Big problem, folks. Big problem. And I appreciate what you're able to do in Landmark, it being a private community. But my concern is you're just pushing the problem one neighborhood well, to that, the next. That's no, what that, the assemblyman's trying that, to address. That's what I'm trying to address, that I want to open the lines of communication, communication from the various agencies, various cities, wh whether it's Huntington Beach, Fountain Valley, Costa Mesa, for example. I don't want to push the problem around. I want to look at, since we're here tonight in Landmark, I do want to look at the concerns of the residents of Landmark and do a walkthrough and see what we can do. But also, I want to share information and try to get the cities on the same page so we can address it from a regional standpoint so we're not having to you know, reinvent the wheel every few years, that we can stay on top of it. I don't think that's really ever been done. I think it's been an individual approach from individual cities when they see a problem, and it takes time for people to speak up, and it, you, know, you, you go through all the heartache of, of lost pets in the meantime. So my goal is to, is to have a regional approach. Okay. Well, thank, thank you all you. very much for your I do time. Thank you. If I might, if I might be able to comment on on the assemblyman's regional approach, we are open to that. We want to participate in that. It also is a little challenging for a variety of reasons. Every city and their elected officials have different That's policies right. and different tolerance for things. Seal Beach contracts with Long Beach in LA County for their animal control services. We contract with Orange County. Some cities do their own animal control. Everybody has a little, each city and each place has a little different nuance and a little different responsibility to their community, not responsibility, but a different approach to fulfilling their responsibility to their individual communities. Um, our city council has taken up this debate and talked about it a, about two years ago, um, and they came up with a policy. And Seal Beach has just now done theirs last night. Theirs is different than ours, so it's a different approach. Um, again, a regional approach might be very viable, but we have to get the city councils on board if it's a That's policy right. perspective. From an information sharing agency working perspective, we do some of that now. We certainly can do that better. We certainly can communicate better with you all as a neighborhood, and me as your chief, and our police department can certainly communicate with you better. I did not know Landmark was having such a problem until I got a call from the assemblyman. Uh, my, my phone didn't ring. I didn't get an email. I'm not saying it should have, but I'm just saying it didn't. It didn't rise to that level. Um, but obviously there's a problem, and we have to do a better job reaching out to you and, and communicating with you all uh, when something like that's happening. I didn't want to take any more time, but I just wanted no, to no. jump in real quick. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is J.C. Hirsch. Uh, I live in Rancho Del Rey, which is off of Edinger, right on the border of the, uh, the uh, Naval Supply Depot up there. 
Uh, first of all, let me say, if I could vote to give you permission to go out and shoot them, I would. No question. But that being said, it can't be done. But one of the things that you constantly talk about is food source. And I'm just wondering if you four gentlemen are influential and, and probably have a lot of contacts and a lot of peers that you could work with to maybe find some body or some group to volunteer to do some sort of an education program. I Maybe it's just being naive, but I got to figure that this woman that you're saying is feeding the feral cats, if she knew that feeding the feral cats was causing her neighbor's animals to get killed, maybe she'd think twice about it. Can I just say Cut. one thing? Yes. We, we've had a, an extensive educational program in Landmark. I think everybody knows all the do nots. Do not leave food out, don't, things like that. We've educated the residents, and we have had other town hall meetings. I don't think that's a problem. I think these gentlemen are going to help us find the answer to our problem. And I think part of, you know, walking through the property, maybe we can identify where they're coming from. I mean, there's lots of things we can, we can ask. Tonight is the beginning of a solution. I'm going to try my best to find a long-term solution, and my door is going to be open to that. And I appreciate very much, and I appreciate the fact that this, uh, this uh, park is supporting and, and doing this, but there's people outside this park that perhaps are ignorant of the... The, the results. We're going to reach out to them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Mary Ann Mercer, I live in the heart of Landmark, and I gave David a beautiful picture of two sunning coyotes. I received this when I was out of town, so I couldn't do anything about it or call. I have, number one, a solution, hopefully, and the other, a question. In walking on Saturday, which I do a lot of walking, I picked up a dead crow, okay? Feet up, thousands of ants, probably West Nile. And then I looked around, there were three cats out about. What if the cat ate the bird and then bit somebody? Also, what if the cat ate the bird and a coyote ate the cat? Then, and then the coyote bit us. Can we get West Nile? I know it's a different story, but. Wow. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. I, the West, I, yeah, we should have invited that. Uh, we're getting vector control. <laughs> I really, truly, that is, that's a fantastic question that I, I don't have an answer for. Uh, our vector control agency is the one that, that is uh, really. Uh, on top of the West Nile issues, meaning they'll actually, the deceased birds that we pick up, they take and test uh, just to be able to offer that information. So I, I would encourage you uh, to contact them or possibly visit their website to find that out because I, I really... Thank you. It was, diseases, you know, it's a it, fantastic question. When I saw the bird and then I thought, saw and, the three cats. <laughs> and they will tell you, uh, West Nile uh, has been on the increase this year. So it is a really important topic and, and certainly one that Perhaps there's, uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to throw vector control into a meme. <laughs> no, but you know, it certainly might be something they'd, they'd be willing to come and discuss with you, because I know they have a great education program, too. Thank you. And a possible solution, Alan. Oh, I was just going to say, if, on your question, if you want to ask either David or Jose from my office, we can put you in touch with somebody from vector control that can address your question. Okay. I, I thought it was interesting. I thought about it later. Possible solution, and also walking around, and this has happened before, we had a neighbor and Huntington Beach and Landmark now, we have a lot of tenants. We have a lot of renters. Many of them do not basically care like, you know, the owners do. But, no, I haven't finished, thank you. That do not speak English or very look, okay? I'm sorry, this has been from observation. I've been in Landmark for 10 years. If you could put out a flyer in the newspapers or tack it up wherever, and if Landmark did it too, in several languages. There are a lot of Japanese, Chinese, Russian. 
there are many people who do not speak the language or speak little English. And we have a, a community newspaper that goes out. But if here in Landmark, we could put these on people's doorstep. You know, in the pictures, no letting your cats out, because they do. There are cats all over that are out. The coyotes do hop the fences when there has been an animal living in that yard. But this is just hopefully a solution in Huntington Beach and here. Put it out in various languages. You know the languages that you need to address. Thank you. So thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. And if there's anyone else who has a question, please come up. Uh, Otherwise, this will be our last speaker, and we're going to have some closing comments. Um, my name's Paul Brestiansky, the only one of the whole country with that name. And I've spoken at the city of Huntington Beach about coyotes. I was asked to speak in Long Beach. I'm not an expert by any means. I work for the federal government and just came back from several years in DC. What I'm amazed uh, at is this wonderful mixture of people here who are attempting to solve the problem. The issue in Seal Beach is not going to be resolved by capture and euthanization, because it will create a vacuum. Other coyotes will come in and occupy that vacuum. That's one of the problems with relocation. But I do have a question, and I have an apology, because I thought this was at 7 o'clock, not at 6 o'clock. So I missed a great deal. I have a question for all the landmark residents here. Um, how many of you have seen coyotes and not reported it to security? Okay, so one of the answers is that each one of us, whether we have a pet or not at Landmark, is responsible for helping to manage the problem. And one of those solutions is to report the location and the time of the coyote sightings. My, my own observations and the, the modest amount of research I've been able to do, and this is consistent with fish and game observations, and that is this. Here in Landmark, it's a haven. They loll around, you know, they relax under the bushes. There's no natural predators. They live by the power station. They come down the Santa Ana River. There's lots of habitats for them. And one of the solutions, obviously, uh, is always a workable solution, is hazing. And I guess we've discussed that. It doesn't matter how tall the obstacle is. They will jump the obstacle. They're smart. But there are some terrifying things that I have seen here. And hopefully, some of the hysteria has been separated from the reality. If you're big enough, and you make enough noise, they're not going to do anything. They'll run away. Wave your arms, you know, yell, growl. It'll work. But if there are three of them, or two of them, one will attack, the other two will try and distract you. That is a relatively recent development that, you know, I've seen in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and other locations, and at Brookhurst and Adams. The most terrifying thing I've seen was here in Landmark. And that is a lady, a week and a half ago, young woman, pushing a baby carriage with a baby in the carriage. And as you know, fish and game, it has happened before. They will attack a child. They will attack anything that's three years old or smaller. And they have snatched babies from baby carriages. So I don't know who it was, but whoever it was here at Landmark, and if you see it, shut it down. The other aspect is, have we discussed the speed of coyotes at all? Uh, how fast they operate? If you've got a pet and you keep it on a 15-foot leash, it's a retractable leash, keep it on a 5-foot leash. Because if it's on a 15-foot leash and the coyote jumps out from the bushes, the pet is gone. They are so fast. They're fast and they're brilliant. One of the other issues that you've brought up is, of course, that you know mating season generates all the pups. Um, and the mother definitely has to feed the pups. At some point, she lets them go. The most recent sightings that I've seen have been 
juveniles who have been let go by the mother and they come here to Landmark to feed because the feeding is, you know, is very, very plentiful. Sir. But Sir. Colorado and Oregon have been successful in developing some methodologies. Sir. And they, did, they've built posts. Did you have a final question? Because we have one more speaker. I do have a final question. Please. Um, are you going to be coming to, uh, to Landmark to review the situation? Uh, I'm happy to be part, to participate in a walkthrough with Chief Handy, with some of the representatives of Landmark, that is a first step. I'm also happy to keep the dialogue open. I also want to give you guys a little challenge. You know, you heard some policy statements up here. The policies are set by elected officials. I'm an assemblyman. You need to speak with your city council members. You need to speak with your county supervisors. They control the purse strings. They control the policy. I'm letting you know what I'm willing to do. And as I'm, long as I'm in elected office, my door's gonna be open. I'm gonna follow through with what we've talked about tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid to touch this issue, but it t it's gonna take more than just me. And it's gonna be up to you to put pressure. Just like you came and spoke with me at my office, I wanna encourage you to talk to your elected officials respectfully. They're gonna have some differing opinions. Not everyone's gonna have the same opinion, but you need to let them know it is a problem. If they don't hear from you, they're gonna think everything's fine. Okay, so you need to respect, respectfully let them know, hey, there are some concerns in my city and my community. So I wanna encourage you to do that. But we have another speaker, and then if there's anyone else, please come up because we're gonna have some fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. One last question. Has there been any discussion or attempt made to do a mapping of the paths that they occupy in Landmark. That's, I think a similar question was addressed. There was someone that addressed that earlier. Thank you. I'm gonna to try to follow up with that as well. If there's anyone else who wants to speak, please come up. This is gonna be our last couple of speakers. Um, I'm gonna interrupt. I know you said you would take a few questions after we're through here. And I would just wanna thank you so much for everything you've done. You've come here, you've answered our questions. You've encouraged us to call the right numbers, and believe me, we will be calling. <laughs> and uh, I'm also in charge of landscaping. I have a little cart, and you're welcome to sit on my little cart, and we'll go all around Landmark, we'll and that. I'll show you where all the paths okay. are. Thank you. Thank you we so have, very much. And we have um, two more questions, and then I'm going to let right. the panelists make some final comments if they wish. Yes, please come up. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Sullivan, a city council member in Huntington Beach, and uh, my intent was to come this evening just to uh, listen and, and learn, and I was with, uh, at the same meeting with uh, Assemblyman Mansoor in Seal Beach <laughs> about two weeks ago and, and got that input. Uh, I want to tell the folks here that uh, Chief Handy has been with us, what, about six months now, Chief? Ten. Ten, okay. But I'm not counting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's done such a good job, it seems just like six. Uh, so anyways, uh, I, my personal opinion is that he is ready to do an outstanding job and is doing an outstanding job. So he, he will react to what he's learned uh, this evening. Also, uh, Assemblyman Mansoor, uh, I think the, what you've mentioned uh, a regional approach certainly seems to uh, be the answer. And actually, I am part of the problem in that over the last month, my, uh, my wife goes, I live in the Huntington Harbor area, and my wife goes walking on the beach early in the morning with some people. And she told me that, you know, she gets the garage. So only one car can fit. So she's in, a car, in an automobile when this happens. But she says three times within the last uh, three months, uh, three weeks, I'm sorry, she has seen uh, coyotes. And interestingly, our area is probably uh, a half a mile from the, the Bolsa Chica and probably the same way up towards uh, the, the area up by Edinger there. But uh, anyways, her, her, what her re description was that, you know, she kind of slowed down and, and looked surprised to see them, and they just kind of looked back at her like, you know, what the heck are you doing here type, type thing. So I, I do think what I have learned tonight 
that there is uh, a lack of reporting, and probably there's a lot more coyotes uh, around than, than we know. So I would encourage everybody, probably, Chief, you could repeat that uh, phone number that the, the folks sure. are, are, are supposed to uh, call. But I, I'm, I'm really uh, encouraged at uh, this. I think this has been a very good and informative uh, evening, and I want to thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Hi, my name's Bunny Slaughter, and I do live here at the Landmark, 906B. And I live right along the Newland um, Wall. And there's been, in the last three weeks, I have seen, personally seen, uh, three coyotes. And looks like one's to be about 50 to 60 pounds, and then two of them are a little smaller. So I'm thinking it's a mom and her cubs. But um, they walk my wall. Con all the time, and I have a dog, and it barks every time the coyotes come by. So I do know that they're along the Newland Wall. A lot of them will come over the fence at the Newland Wall. And I have a personal a question, and this is a question from my neighbor. Everybody that lives around me is anywhere from 78 and up, and um, they want to know, will a coyote attack a senior that's like on a walker, or because that's their fear. They're afraid to go out, and especially in the early morning hours. So that's my questions. Good question. The coyote doesn't see the human as a food source. It relates the food source to the pet that you've got on a leash or you're carrying. Okay. Now, where there is a problem when when there is a child. Back in 1981, if you if you Google. In Glendale, there was a little girl that was, it was the only fatality that we've had in California. But coyotes are not looking at you as a food source. They're looking at you as the link to their food source. So when they see you and they get rewarded with food, could be trash, could be fruit that's fallen on the ground during the summer months, then they realize that, you know what, I may want to follow and investigate. Remember, they are smart. We need to be smarter than they are. We can all do it. It's just going to take a little bit more thought on our part. A um, couple good books out to read. One's uh, Solving Coyote Problems by John Trout, Jr. Talks about what's going on throughout the United States and some of the things that they are utilizing to. So it's, um, it's something that it's a way of life. It's a process of maturation on our point, OK? It's almost more in terms of changing our behavior than it is the, the, uh, the coyotes, okay? Because when we change our behavior, the coyotes got to follow suit. That's the way M Mother Nature created them. So it's understanding that. It's communicating. It's bringing awareness to other people that may move into the area than, that aren't aware of coyotes, that have never had that experience. And that's where the building good communities through whether it's Neighborhood Watch, a Wildlife Watch program, could be a DARE program, whatever it is. When we communicate with each other, just like Ron Shelton's doing in Fountain Valley, it makes a difference. You may save somebody's pet. And with that, I want to thank uh, all the panelists. Thank you, Chief Handy. Uh, Chief Handy took the time to meet with me prior to this, and I I really appreciate that. I, I very much, I very much do. Uh, Kent, thank you so much uh, for your input, at not only tonight but in Seal Beach. Uh, Ryan, I really appreciate it. Um, if any of you have any final comments that you wanted to that we didn't get to, or sure, please, Chief. I'd like to repeat the number real quick in the, the email address also, and I have about 50 handouts up here, um, so I'd be happy to give them to you. There's a a pamphlet we give out. There's a, a website address on the city website. We have a video um, that talks about hazing, talks about removing food sources and things like that. Um, but the, the name of the person I'd like for you to call just to report a sighting is Denise Robsell. And it's R-O-B-S-E-L. And her phone number is 714-536-5913. And her email address is D, is in Denise, R O B S E L, Robsell, at hbpd.org.
We have not mapped coyote sightings in the past, but we map our crimes. We map a lot of things. We certainly can map coyote sightings. We um, will be more in tune and looking for patterns. But the one thing I would like to say is we're going to still see coyotes. You're going to still see coyotes. Um, we're not going to get rid of coyotes tomorrow. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Huntington Beach has changed in the last 50, 75 years with development, with encroachment. And it is very common in many places across the country where there's conflicts between development and people who are living in, in this type of an environment with the access from the flood channels and other things. Um, a simple sighting is not necessarily something we will respond to. I just want to repeat that, but we will track those. We will look for patterns. We will look for aggressive sightings. We will uh, respond to those. Um, and I'll be happy to come out and walk the community, but I'll also be happy to come out anytime to your HOA meetings as well as sending staff um, on a regular basis if that's what we need to do or want to do. And I'll make sure you have my contact number as well before we leave. So thank you all for having us tonight. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Landmark, and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. Thank you.